And then, well, again, welcome everybody. So today we have a, um, I would say a special session of our Primavera Colloquium, which we established during the, the COVID Corona times. And we're very pleased that uh, Franz Ulliup is here today. Um, to give a very short introduction, Franz is an associate professor at uh, TU Delft. Uh, before this, he did his PhD at the University of Amsterdam and had positions at MIT, Maastricht University and the University of Liverpool. Franz, I hope this covers everything. And yeah. um, well, to give a general introduction, Franz is uh, known, I would say, all over the world for strong and foundational results on planning, machine learning, learning and uncertainty. I've seen his name many, many times on papers and, uh, until I met him the first time. So um, perhaps to give a highlight, uh, Franz has an ERC starting run on the project Influence, and perhaps we'll hear something about this uh, today. And um, well, Franz is in particular also an expert on reinforcement learning. And during the last years when running this Primavera project, we saw a lot of basically applications for reinforcement learning within the predictive maintenance settings. So um, we're extremely excited to um, have Franz here today. Um, so please go ahead. All right, thank you very much, uh, Nils, for a very gentle uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and uh, be able to speak to all of you. Uh, like already just, just alluded to, uh, to the extent possible, I would like this to be as, as interactive as possible as, 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 as we can get it. Um, and also, um, I would like to focus the time on uh, talking about things which are most relevant for you. The slides that I have are, are starting very basic, uh, uh, but I try to you know, somehow get to a level where uh, you get some understanding of uh, you know, how does uh, something like DQN, uh, so the reinforcement learning for Atari games uh, work, uh, and uh, Alpha Zero. Uh, if you were hoping to you know, get much more recent, really state-of-the-art state, state, state insights, I don't have uh, many of those. I do have many, many, many slides with uh, challenges that I probably will not be able to cover all of them, um, but I can uh, somehow point out at least at the different areas and then we can see if there's time, if we can zoom in on uh, you know, one or two, if they're particularly interesting for the crowd. All right, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, I guess I'll dive in. Let me see where is my mouse and on the focus. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, and so this is the bit where uh, I'm going to rely a little bit on, 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 on Niels, um, just to kind of like assess a little bit uh, the crowd here. Uh, I, uh, I'm quite interested in, in, in knowing a little bit about what people already know. So uh, the first question is, uh, who knows what an MDP is? And so perhaps you can somehow signal uh, with one of these uh, reaction uh, thingies uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you know, and then uh, we'll try and... Uh, yeah, so this is, I think, uh, quite, quite a few. Oh yeah, actually I get a counter now. Five people raised their hand. And then there's also and some. And many of up. them did the thumbs up. So um, yeah, 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 yeah. About yeah. half of them know what an MVP is. I would say. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a very good start already. Uh, um, the other half of the people, I will try to also keep on board. Um, what reinforcement learning is? Who uh, who thinks they uh, they know this? Right now, the old guy and tracing. Okay, twelve people. Perfect. Um, well, okay, what DQN is, I think I gave away, but, but who knows how DQN works? Let me jump, directly jump to that one. Four, five. Okay, well. So some people, so that's good. Not too much, which is perhaps also good because, well, the first part is going to be a little bit more boring uh, for you, I think, if, if you already know how DQNs works, but, you know, perhaps I can still give some other perspectives here and there. Uh, yeah, then finally, Monte Carlo Tree Search. Who um, is familiar with this? Yeah, also a small set. Are these all the same people as the, who also knew that uh, how DQN worked? It's difficult to assess, I suppose, yeah, but... Uh, I think so, yes. 
I expect uh, these this will be uh, a lot of same overlap. All right, well, good. Yeah, so like I said, uh, and my goal is to somehow uh, at the end of this talk, try and get to a point where everybody here has a reasonable high level idea of, you know, how does DQN work and how does AlphaGo, which is a bit of a combination of Monte Carlo research and DQN. All right, um, yeah, before we get technical though, uh, let's start with uh, a, a bit of a glimpse. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, one of the movies that I think uh, got a lot of people interested in uh, uh, reinforcement learning again. So this is a video uh, 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 of DQN uh, playing. So this is uh, 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 an agent that learns to play breakout this game. And as it trains more and more, the performance uh, gets uh, well, somewhat better, better. And so uh, this is really quite impressive already because this agent learns to play this game really based on the images that you are looking at, right? So learning to control this from, from, from pixels, right? that was quite novel. Um, but then this thing happened uh, and I think uh, it got a lot of people excited uh, back then. And I, I still think it's nice. Right? So the the agent learns that it should try and make a tunnel and get the ball up there to score many points quickly. Right, uh, so that's a very, very sophisticated strategy you could argue. And uh, yeah, it learned this all from scratch from pixels. Well, another uh, clear example, of course, is AlphaGo, uh, and uh, we have seen, of course, other successes of reinforcement learning since, but uh, this was also a big breakthrough where uh, now the game of Go that, you know, had seemed out of reach for so long, uh, uh, suddenly was really mastered by uh, a computer agent, and uh, it was beating world champions. Well, one more. Uh, this is also a, a nice example uh, from uh, OpenAI. Uh, 2019, where they had these agents learn to play hide and seek. So the blue agents need to hide themselves and the red agent needs to find the blue agent. And uh, so what you see is that uh, over time, blue agents learn to use these tools, uh, these boxes to hide themselves, but then the red agents learn to use the ramp and go over uh, uh, the thing. Uh, but then the blue agents learn to first take the ramp and then close the doors with the boxes. Um, and so we see this ongoing evolution uh, uh, between uh, these agents, uh, demonstrating what seems uh, to be quite uh, intelligent, sophisticated behaviors. All right. OK. So that's a, a, a little bit of a, a glimpse. Um, like I said, there have been many uh, uh, other uh, developments and uh, I haven't uh, uh, updated uh, these, these slides since the last, what is it, uh, half year or so. Uh, so I'm quite certain that I'm already missing again uh, some new things such as uh, uh, reinforcement learning, now learning to sort, et cetera. Um, yeah, let me continue. I think I will probably have the attention of, uh, of everybody. Please, uh, if you have questions, do just send something in chat uh, uh, and stop me. I'm happy, happy to elaborate. Right, okay. Well, so of course, all these, uh, these games are nice, um, but reinforcement learning also is quite important, I think, for the real world, right? So if you think about problems like uh, uh, traffic control, uh, uh, robots that need to collaborate with human partners uh, on the work floor, uh, somehow a medical diagnosis, medical treatments, uh, and how we can optimize those, uh, or perhaps uh, doing things like uh, wildlife protection. All of these are problems of a sequential nature, and in all of these, reinforcement learning might potentially play an important role. All right, well, so that is uh, more or less the teaser. The remainder of this talk will be divided in, let's say, the foundations of reinforcement learning, somehow the basic ideas and uh, techniques on which everything is built. We'll use that then to somehow give uh, this intuition, at least behind the state of the art. Uh, and then finally, well, quickly cover some of the challenges. We'll see how it goes. 
All right. So um, sequential decision making uh, is a term I just already used. Uh, what does that really mean? Well, that means that we're really trying to take actions over multiple time steps. And uh, sequential decision making problems are quite complex uh, because of this. So not only that does uh, it mean that we need to balance some of immediate rewards versus long term benefits, uh, but also we may need to deal with various kinds of uncertainty. Right. So I uh, always like to explain this with a simple example of, say, this robot here. Uh, you can also see my pointer, by the way, right? Just uh, checking. Yes. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. Uh, this robot here that wants to go to, uh, well, some goal location. But, uh, you know, there's this pond or, I don't know, some other object in between uh, uh, that it doesn't want to fall into. So now, of course, uh, the, the shortest route would be here on the right side, uh, but it takes it very close to this, this pond. So if the uncertainty in the movement of this robot would be quite severe, uh, because of you know the issues of motor control or whatnot, uh, um, or just you know, think of yourself, right? How how close next to a ravine are you comfortable to walk, right? So so how good you are, how skilled you are, affects what route you might be willing to take, right? So if you're more uncertain about your movement, you might go the longer way around the pond, uh, uh, and if you're really very uncertain, you might take you know the very big route uh, way around. Well, of course, intuitively, all of this makes sense, um, but then actually implementing such uh, trade-offs is not that obvious, right? Certainly not obvious to program manually. Uh, and that is why, you know, in, 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 in sequential decision-making, we often fall back on this paradigm of, of programming via rewards, if you will. Uh, so that means uh, planning and or, or reinforcement learning. Okay, so how is this then formalized? Well, this is then formalized as this Markov decision process, MDP, that I mentioned uh, before. And so it's a relatively simple model where there's essentially states, actions, rewards, um, and uh, transitions. So we have an agent here, and the agent takes actions, and as a result of these actions, the state will change in some way, and a reward's gonna be issued. Right, so uh, typically the, the transitions between states might be stochastic. So given a particular state and action, there's some probability distribution over next states as prime. Um, and the rewards can also be stochastic uh, if, we, uh, if we want, uh, drawn also from some reward function and that depends on the state and action. So the agent takes an action, the world changes uh, and a reward is emitted. And then at that moment, the agent observes the next state as prime and the process repeats. So then, given the, such a setup, the question of course is how to balance this, this short-term versus long-term reward. At every time that we get one of these immediate rewards, how do we balance them? Uh, and how do we then take into account that uncertainty? All right, so to formalize this, uh, we are gonna have to formalize the objective of uh, the MDP, of the market decision process. And typically uh, the goal is to, to optimize the so-called value of the policy. So policy is how we're going to act. We want to find the policy which has the highest value. And what is the value precisely? Well, very often, typically in, in reinforcement learning, we take the expected discounted sum of rewards, right? So the value of a policy is just the expectation uh, of uh, the re rewards that we're gonna get over the different time steps uh, and it's discounted by this uh, factor gamma. So this is a, a factor between zero and one. Uh, and that uh, 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 term makes sure that rewards that we receive further into the future, uh, so if the time step is large, uh, uh, they're gonna weigh exponentially less. Okay, well, so there's all kinds of reasons why that may or may not be a good idea. We'll not go into uh, uh, much of those considerations here. Uh, happy to discuss uh, uh, after. Um, but this is somehow uh, the, the, the usual uh, objective that we're trying to optimize. And then so uh, uh, given an MDP, really our task now is, is one of planning, right? We want to compute a good or, or ideally optimal policy pie uh, given the model that we have, given the description of this MDP. 
or assimilate. Okay, how do people then do that? Well, typical uh, approach is to then compute the so-called optimal value functions or optimal Q value functions, right? So uh, we're gonna denote this thing with Q star of S and A, uh, and that expresses the amount of value and the amount of expected discounted uh, sum of rewards that we expect starting from the particular state S uh, and then taking action A and then continuing optimally afterwards, right? So this really encodes this principle of, the, of, of optimality where we now figure out what action to take now, given that we will act optimally afterwards. And that's really what's uh, expressed by these uh, quite famous Bellman uh, optimality equations. It says that Q star of S and A, and so the optimal value that we expect when we take action A in state S is gonna be, well, it's gonna be this immediate reward term uh, plus gamma, that is discounting factor, times the expected value at the next time step. So this uh, probability of going to a particular state as prime and then the optimal value of that state as prime. And what is then that optimal state, op optimal value of that next state as prime? Well, that is uh, 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 precisely taking the maximum action uh, in that next time step. All right, so just a quick example. Um, we have an example of a robot here, it needs to go to the toolbox and pick it up. And then it gets rewards plus one. So we'll assume that gamma, the discount factor is 0.9. And to keep it simple here, we're gonna assume deterministic movements here. So here as a cheat sheet, I have these uh, Q star and V star. Uh, and so we're gonna get started, right? So essentially how this uh, works is uh, if we were at uh, square 50, then we could uh, uh, do the pickup action and we will get plus one, right? So that means that Q star of being in state 15 and doing the action pickup is going to be uh, uh, one. And of course, that also means that, you know, the V star uh, is also going to be one because, you know, we can do the pickup. It's going to be the maximizing uh, action. Well, great. So now, what if we were at state 14? Well, of course, in that case, we could uh, uh, pick the action right, uh, we would get immediate reward zero. But then we're gonna be in the state 15, uh, which has value one, right? So we're gonna get zero right now, but the, the, the uh, value of the expected future state is one, and we're discounting it with 0.9, leading to this value. Right, and uh, similar as before, of course, that also means that the value uh, is going to be 0.9 here. And uh, similarly, we can work our way back through this grid uh, or make multiple sweeps over the grid that doesn't matter so much uh, and compute these values at all these different uh, different uh, places. And uh, so we see that at the starting position, the expected uh, 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 discounted sum of rewards is 0.48. All right, so this is just a form of planning uh, called dynamic programming. I think this probably quite clear for, 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 for most people uh, uh, now. If not, it is a good time perhaps to ask questions. And otherwise I will just continue. Okay. So, well, that's uh, MDP planning. Given an MDP, uh, uh, states, actions, transitions, rewards, uh, computer policy that optimizes value. So now what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is uh, where actually we're not given this MDP. So the typical assumption that we make in reinforcement learning is that well, we may know what this set of states and we may know what this is a set of actions, but perhaps we don't know the transition model and perhaps we don't know the reward uh, function. And so that means we can't compute an optimal policy anymore. Now, somehow we now need to learn what is good behavior by actually trying it out in the environment. Right, and that means that well, at least according to, to my definitions, people do disagree about these kinds of things, but 
uh, uh, in my book, reinforcement learning is a problem, not a particular technique. Now, there's different techniques that we can use to try and solve this problem, but this is a problem. What do you do if you do not know in what MDP you are? And just to uh, drive this through, you know, it's this kind of problem. Um, so you are in state 23, what do you want to do? You can do action A or B. And, uh, you know, well, imagine we are this agent now and we uh, pick uh, some action, uh, uh, action A here, and we get plus 14. Well, great. So, uh, so we were in some state 23, we took action A and we uh, jumped to a uh, next state, state 12. Uh, and we got the reward plus 14, all oh, great. Uh, so that's great. So what do we want to do now? Uh, well, you know, uh, we were not in state 12 before, so we really have no clue. Um, let's do action B this time. Oh, we got minus 30, but well, that doesn't seem great. Uh, we're in state uh, 23 uh, again now. So what do we do now? Do we do action A again? You know, we might get plus 14 again or not, or perhaps action B is actually very good in the state, right? Just all things we don't know yet at this point. Okay, yeah, so I hope that gets across a little bit like, like you know, the, 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 the feeling of the agent, you know, who is tasked to now solve this problem. We think of the world with our human eyes, these problems are quite simple. If we think of them really as MDPs and somehow, you know, states with indices, this is not very intuitive. All right. So then, Q learning. Q learning is a technique uh, that we can use for the reinforcement learning problem. Essentially, it takes this Bellman equation that we saw before and modifies it uh, into an update equation that can now work on sampled experience. Right, so uh, particularly after every transition that we make in the environment, uh, so we, we were in a previous state, took an action, got a reward, and now ended up in the next state as prime. Now we can apply this update uh, uh, equation, uh, which uh, does the following thing. It's going to update uh, the value of SA, and it's going to, you know, retain one minus alpha, the old value, and move into the direction of this update target with the fraction alpha. And what's the update target? Well, the update target is the reward that we got plus uh, uh, gamma times the maximizing action that we can take at the resulting state as prime, right? So the idea is that well, these estimates now of these uh, Q functions will improve over time. And this is somehow, you know, uh, uh, updating in the direction of what we think is, is optimal. This is doing the, what we're thinking optimal at the next time step. Uh, and that's what we're using to update those values. That's a very nice algorithm. Uh, uh, and we will need to make sure that we try out uh, uh, all actions sufficiently often, visit all states and try out all the actions. Uh, so we need to sufficiently explore. Uh, but if we do that, then uh, uh, just applying this update uh, equation will convert to, to this optimal Q star value function. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, this is a moment where, where I like to discuss a little bit of uh, terminology, indeed. Once there so, was a question in the chat. This is okay oh, yeah. To, um, absolutely, should absolutely. Should yeah, I read it? If you, yeah, if possible, because I, I can't see yeah, the chat here at all now. So, so Greg Alpar asks, what is an intuitive explanation that this update equation is a normalized weighing? Let me try. No, I really can't see the chat. So what is the intuitive explanation? That the update equation is a normalized weighing is what the question states. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not completely certain if I can really understand the question. Can, can you perhaps uh, expand on that? So Greg, if you- Yeah, good afternoon. Just, yeah. Can you hear Hello. me? Yes. yes, yes. Yeah, so the equation has this alpha and one minus alpha. So it seems that this is, uh, yeah, a, a weight equation uh, with uh, two quantities. 
And I was wondering if uh, that has a, an intuitive explanation. Um, okay, I see. Yeah, so, so I'm, 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 I'm not completely certain if it has a really intuitive explanation, but this alpha essentially is the learning, the learning uh, rate, right? So if you take alpha higher, then you're gonna make larger updates into the direction of this update target. Um, and that, for instance, is very good if your problem is deterministic. Actually, if your problem is deterministic, you should just pick alpha equals one, right? Because then you can just, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the update target will be uh, 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 precisely the quantity that then you expect every time again. But if the problem is stochastic, so uh, the S prime that you're sampling may be uh, stochastic or the reward might be stochastic. In that case, it's important to take alpha sufficiently slow such that uh, you're gonna uh, average over the stochasticity, if you will. Does that somehow? Yes, help? thanks. Yeah, yeah, completely, thanks. Okay, yeah, great. Any, any other questions here? Okay, let me then move to this terminology thing. Um, let's see, yeah. So uh, there's a bunch of things now going on. Um, and uh, this sometimes confuses people. Uh, and li like I said, uh, there's, there's no actually real consensus even, I think, on, on what to call some of these things. Uh, but this is how I like to think about things, and it does provide me with some clarity. So let me try and share my subjective perspective here, and hopefully it also uh, serves you well. Okay, so if the model is available, I call this uh, 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 planning, right? And so if the model is small, uh, like the, picking up the, the toolbox we saw, we can do exact planning uh, of, of different sorts. Uh, if a problem is large, uh, then that actually becomes difficult. Dynamic programming, et cetera, becomes hard. And so we need to do different things like simulation-based planning, which has been uh, uh, considered under various terms in the uh, 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 literature, like approximate dynamic programming, neurodynamic programming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, if the model is not available, I call this reinforcement learning. And there we can distinguish uh, uh, different versions or different flavors of reinforcement learning. Model-based reinforcement learning actually tries to learn the MDP model. Uh, Model-free reinforcement learning does not try to do that, but it tries to either directly learn this value function, uh, this Q star. Um, it tries to somehow learn directly from experience. Well, that is what Q learning does right here. Uh, or uh, it can try to directly learn the policy. Uh, um, that's also possible. Um, so now a common confusion is mixing up these two things, for instance, right? Uh, planning is when we have the model available. If you use model-based RL, you're gonna learn a model. And of course, you're also gonna use that then typically to do planning. Right, but it's not the same. Specifically, in planning, we assume that the model is exact. In model-based RL, you're learning a model and that model will have imperfections. So really, if you're gonna use it for planning, you may want to reason about the imperfections or the uncertainty in the model. Another com typical confusion is, of course, between these uh, categories. Uh, this, what I call simulation-based planning uh, versus model-free RL. Right, so many people uh, have uh, called simulation-based planning uh, or a neurodynamic program as, as equivalent really to reinforcement learning even. Um, but I do think that there's really differences here, right? Uh, so in simulation-based planning, we uh, really care about computational costs only, right? The model is in principle available, we can sample from it, it's all computational costs. Um, in model-free RL, we need to sample from the real world that we're trying to learn, or learn from because we don't know how that world works. So it will involve uh, actual interaction with the actual environment. And that means that we're learning online uh, and, and we care about the rewards that will be generated online. 
So why we care about the regret that we might suffer. Um, yeah, this of course uh, is uh, uh, a good insight, right? Like we can use Q-learning for both of these problems here, right? For simulation-based planning, we can use Q-learning because we can sample from our simulator. And that's actually, you know, what people have been doing in, in, in most of reinforcement learning to make it uh, extra confusing. Um, and we can try to use uh, Q-learning uh, directly for this model-free RL problem. Of course, nobody is really doing this uh, uh, in practice because Q-learning is not that sample efficient. And if you're gonna try and do Q-learning on a real, real world problem in the real world, yeah, your regret is most likely gonna be way too high. So this is only very exceptional cases that that is possible. Okay, yeah, I hope this uh, uh, clarifies a little bit how these things relate. If there's comments or suggestions or questions, let me know, and otherwise I will move on. Because I see that I also will actually need to hurry up a little bit now. Um, Monte Carlo Tree Search. Monte Carlo Tree Search is a method for performing planning, again, online planning. And the idea here is that if you have a big problem, it may not be possible to plan for all the states. So an alternative might be to try and plan only for the current state. So this is uh, what is, for instance, also a, a common practice in, in, in chess, right? You essentially do somehow some look at search. Okay, and the advantage of course is then that that's really gonna focus the computational effort on the state that can be reached in the near future. Okay, so let me try and see. You know, um, we were talking about policies before. I will be a little bit quick here. Um, and we thought of, uh, of these policies essentially as, you know, uh, in a particular state, we're gonna specify a particular action. And, you know, typically you can, you know, think of, of a table like this. Here's the goal. So we're gonna move this direction here, this direction here, over here, we're gonna go, this, et cetera. Um, that's one representation. Something else that you could use is a neural network, which you know is being done in DQM, for instance. Uh, and another uh, thing you could do is that the policy could be an entire planning algorithm. So this is essentially what Monte Carlo research does, right? It applies at every time step a uh, policy, which is now going to do some some planning. All right. So. Um, Online planning is essentially a kind of a pre-specified policy. Um, and uh, so, so, so I don't know, I, I like to somehow reflect on this a little bit. Um, so you can imagine that that to some extent implies that learning to plan may not be inherently completely different uh, uh, than learning say a, a policy with a neural network, right? There's perhaps no principal difference there, but anyways. Back to the online planning. Um, so how does this work? Well, we already saw dynamic programming with the, the pick up the toolbox, right? So now the idea is that essentially to do online planning, we're gonna construct a tree, a look at tree for the next number of time steps, say T. And of course that, uh, that tree, uh, might be very big, but if we construct this tree, then we can just do dynamic programming on top of this, right? So we can look at uh, the leaves. Uh, so perhaps there are some heuristic values here. Let's say in chess, you have a heuristic valuation function. And then we can, uh, again, compute these Q functions with this uh, Bellman uh, uh, tomality equation, right? Where we just propagate the values essentially. You can do that in all these different places. And then in the nodes where we're making the choice, we uh, select, oh, sorry. We select uh, the action, of course, that's gonna maximize the value, right? So in this case, we'll pick action A1 because 3.6 uh, is higher than 3.5. The expected value here is higher than the expected value there. And then you can do that on this entire tree. 
So in principle, this is actually you know, intuitively not very complex. But of course, uh, the problem is in scaling this up. You can scale this up. You can just you know, okay, take action A1 now and go through this loop again uh, at the next time step. So the problem, of course, is the tree gets used. So how can we counter this? Oh, Monte Carlo Tree Search tries to provide leverage by incrementally constructing a sampled version of this tree, focusing on the most promising regions. Right, so intuitively, that's sort of starting with, with just the one root node uh, at this moment. Uh, say we take action A1, then we're gonna add the new node here, uh, and then we're gonna uh, somehow use a random rollout policy. So we got an immediate reward here of plus four, the, the random rollout gave us uh, plus 10. And uh, those numbers are then gonna be stored in the tree somehow. You know, Those are gonna be statistics that we're gonna use later on. Well, we do it again. We start at the, at, at the root node, take action A2 this time, um, end up in some next state, SE. This is being added as a new node in the tree. We will roll out again, store the immediate reward and, uh, and the uh, uh, return of the rollout. Oh, we do this again and again, and this tree becomes bigger and bigger. Like I said, at these different uh, uh, nodes, we are storing the statistics of all the rewards that we've observed under these nodes. And those are then used to try and direct the search into promising regions. And there's a nice uh, uh, UCB formula that people typically use. You could do different things as well. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but this is uh, the, 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 the intuition of what Monte Carlo Tree Search does here. It's really using those statistics to now focus the tree onto the promising areas. All right, uh, let me see. Yeah, I am gonna perhaps be very quick on this. Um, there's the idea that, you know, this, these rollouts can be random, um, but you could also use another policy that you already have lying around, right? Or that you've learned before. And then if you use such a policy, you can think of doing this tree search, additional tree search as a, a type of way to improve the policy that you already have, right? So people often think of Monte Carlo tree search as a, a policy improvement operator. And that's really what uh, we'll see AlphaGo also does. Okay, um, so what's good about Monte Carlo tree search uh, that rapidly zooms in on these promising regions uh, and can you improve these policies? Uh, has been applied in, uh, with a lot of success in many cases. Uh, it does not really work very well for a needle in the haystack problem because it has no way of zooming in on then the promising region. Uh, or if problems have a very high branching factor, there's uh, other things that you need to uh, somehow do. Good. Well, that's the foundations part. Uh, so I will still be able to 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 give. I think the intuition uh, about the state of the art. Let me just try and summarize quickly what we covered. We covered MDPs uh, as a formal model of sequential decision-making. If that MDP model is available, our problem is one of planning. If it's not, it's a reinforcement learning problem. So reinforcement learning is a problem, I claim at least, and Q-learning is one of the most popular techniques for addressing this problem. For complex problems, uh, um, you know, we usually cannot represent the policy as just a table. And so we can do online planning instead. Uh, of course, if we do have somehow infinite computation, you know, you can expand the entire tree until uh, uh, the horizon that you care about and do dynamic programming on top of it. Uh, in practice, you will not have infinite computation, certainly not during online planning. Uh, and Monte Carlo research has been a very, very, very successful and uh, powerful method uh, in that setting. It avoids creating this entire tree and focuses on the promising parts. All right. 
so then let me try and and and, and give at least uh, this this idea of a glimpse of, of what does the QN do and what does uh, AlphaGo do. Starting with the QN. So like I said, uh, most of the things that we've been looking uh, uh, at so far are what's called tabular. Uh, so the, the, the Q as A values are stored, say, in a table for uh, every uh, state in action. So if your MDP is very, very big, like uh, the number of possible screens in Atari, uh, then that will not work. And so, yeah, you need to do something else like function approximation to scale this up. Right, and so of course, one obvious idea is to then perhaps represent this function Q as A with a neural network of some sorts. Right, so somehow you have your, your input image, uh, the pixels just act as features, and this is now being fed through the neural network. And then at the output layer, you might uh, predict values for all the different possible actions. Right, so here's uh, the joystick, it can move eight directions and then you can simultaneously press the button. Uh, and so you get, what is it, uh, 16, 17, 18 uh, actions. No movement or button or only the button also. Right, uh, well, that is essentially precisely what uh, DQN does, right? It uh, trains this Q network that was uh, done with these 84 times 84 images and spits out these action values. Uh, and then somehow this is trained with Q learning. Uh, the big issue is that, uh, and of course, so Q learning, you can adapt to work with function approximation. I, I won't cover uh, uh, all of the details there, uh, but uh, it, yeah, that can be done. The big problem is, uh, though, that if you apply Q-learning with neural networks, uh, things may no longer converge. Soon as you start using function approximation, uh, all of these uh, reinforcement learning methods, Q-learning, uh, et cetera, they become much more fickle. So there's a need to somehow stabilize uh, this learning. Of course, ideally, we would just you know, have now a new learning algorithm uh, which does converge and still works fine. In practice, uh, finding such algorithms isn't so easy. And the, the big breakthrough to some extent of DQN was the fact that they just came up with a number of techniques that were sufficient in stabilizing this learning uh, such that you know the, 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 this neural network still, still trained appropriately. There were three techniques that they introduced, experience replay, is the idea that you retain all your past experience in a buffer, a so-called replay buffer. Uh, and so the, uh, your experience are these topples, state, action, reward, next state. And then by randomly sampling in this buffer, the data that you use to, to train your neural network becomes more IID, right? The, the dependencies, the correlations between the data are, are broken up and that helps. Another uh, technique was to introduce a target network. So if we look at the Q update, how far back do I need to go? Let me quickly see if I can get there. Come on. I will need to go forward as well. <laughs> yeah. Laptop. Oh, it's terribly slow. Almost there. Yeah, there, okay. So if we're doing these, these kind of updates, we're updating this value Q, uh, but in order to update it, we are using a Q value itself of the next state. So if this is now the same network that can also lead to instabilities as you imagine. So what is being done is that this, uh, the one that's used for the target is essentially frozen for some amount of time, such that uh, you reduce the amount of, 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 of instability uh, uh, that's happening. Yeah, let me try and get back quickly.
Yes, 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 yes. All right. Um, yeah. So that's this idea of using this target network. And then there also was uh, a form of somehow clipping the gradient. So Edis neural networks updated with some gradients. They can become very big in, in wrong places uh, sometimes. So somehow by just clipping then these, these gradients uh, to avoid too big updates to the network, uh, that can also help. And then altogether, voila, that leads to sufficient stability to, to train uh, uh, this network, the QN, on these Atari games. Okay, so that is uh, the intuition really behind, behind TQN. It is a relatively straightforward application of, of Q learning, uh, but you need to yeah, do a, a number of these tricks to really stabilize the learning. And of course, uh, that works well in these Atari games. Uh, if you have a different reinforcement learning problem, it might not work as well. Uh, so it's not said that the QN will always work on your problem. Uh, to some extent, uh, many of these, these methods remain a little bit of an art more than a technology uh, at, at the moment. Okay, then uh, AlphaGo. So AlphaGo also uses neural networks, but now also combines this with Monte Carlo Tree Search. I said that we can think of this as a policy uh, improvement operator, and to some extent, that is how, how AlphaGo uses this. Right? Um, well, thinking from Monte Carlo Tree Search perspective, what are the main challenges of applying Monte Carlo Tree Search to a game like Go? Well, one is that there's many actions. I'm not certain uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with the game of Go precisely, but it's uh, a large board, uh, 20 by 20, I believe. So uh, there's 400 positions uh, top from uh, top, top of my head. Um, so to deal with those many actions, the uh, AlphaGo approach learns a policy network to somehow steer the action selection. And the other problem, of course, is that uh, Go games can take very long. So that would lead to very uh, deep trees and having to do very long rollouts. Um, in chess, it's easy to define a heuristic function such that you can cap the amount of look at you can do. But in Go, that was always very difficult. Uh, so what they've done is to learn a value network, learn the heuristic uh, uh, evaluation function at the nodes. All right, so trying to get this across, this was our, our image of Monte Carlo tree search that we saw before, where you know we uh, had uh, uh, a root node, uh, apparently added this node before, then now we're adding this node on the right and we're doing a rollout. Now, what AlphaGo does is it changes this, right? So rather than just considering all these actions, uh, it will have somehow probabilities of selecting these actions uh, that uh, are prior probabilities that are selected by this, this, this uh, 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 policy uh, network. And uh, rather than doing the rollout, uh, it will use a value estimate. And then, so uh, this is essentially now combined in a single neural network uh, that is gonna predict these P's and the V's. Right, so the P is going to be used to now initially initialize the prior probabilities for this particular node, and the V is the value uh, that's predicted that's going to be used for updating uh, uh, the the Q estimates in the tree. So then, the question, of course, is where does this neural network come from? In the original version of AlphaGo, uh, this was initialized still from human data. And then because you know, um, it acts as a, a policy improvement operator, you can improve from that point on. And in later uh, uh, versions, uh, so AlphaGo zero uh, was learned from zero human knowledge. Uh, and there it was purely trained by, uh, by self play, playing against itself. All right, yeah, so um, 
that is more or less the intuition between, uh, behind these methods that have been very influential uh, and that are still being applied to lots of problems. Um, so I hope that's useful for, uh, for, for you all to think about. We have only a little bit of time left, I think. Um, and yeah, like I said, I have many, many slides about all of these challenges uh, that I will not be able to, uh, to cover. Um, so let me just perhaps, you know, state uh, 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 what I think are, are really a very big challenges uh, based on this overview. And then we can see if, if uh, there's still well, uh, appetite uh, for going into some discussion or overtime on, on some of these. I'm happy to talk more. Uh, I can make it a bit later, but I am wary that uh, most of you will want to probably uh, log off in time. Um, yeah. So what I think is uh, the, the, the biggest challenges at this point are certainly sample complexity. So this is the amount of samples that your reinforcement learning method need. Like I said, nobody is really applying uh, uh, Q-learning to a real-world problem because real-world problems, if you have a robot that you want to somehow learn to control, it cannot make so many mistakes because it will be damaged very soon. Learning models of the environment has been uh, a big challenge. There has been lots of work on this in recent years. Uh, but, you know, DQN uh, and AlphaGo, they're all these model-free methods. And people were thinking, well, but, you know, why can't we just use the, the, the neural networks to learn models? But, yeah, somehow learning reliable models is not straightforward. And the, the problem still isn't solved completely, I think. Partial observability is something that we didn't touch upon in this talk at all, but most environments, it's not possible to observe a Markovian state. The MDP uh, state and MDP is, is sort of quite powerful because yeah, it really says that, well, if this is the state and I take a particular action, then this is a probability of the next state. And you're observing all that relevant quantities. Uh, if you are not observing all those quantities, uh, actually, you know, predicting a, a just a observation, a noisy observation from a previous noisy observation may not be so meaningful to even do. And so the problem becomes much more complex. Um, yeah, in general, uh, uh, scaling uh, and abstraction, I think, uh, have always been important problems with reinforcement learning. Uh, neural networks take, take account of some of this, but uh, perhaps not, Perhaps we can't leave everything to neural networks. Perhaps these are still topics to explicitly think about. Certainly also if you're interested more in guarantees and verification. Multi-agent systems is a whole other can of worms that opens up because what now if other agents also start interacting in the environment and they might also learn about you. Uh, so now the, the, the problem is not stationary anymore. Learning becomes much complicated. Uh, and overall, the, the, the you know overall machine learning question of generalization uh, to new problems. You're learning on, on a couple of example problems. Now, will you also be able to learn or, or deal with a new problem? Uh, yes or no? Uh, and that's also a very active area of research at the moment still. Um, yeah, I think let, let me just stop here see if there's any any questions uh, or indeed uh, if, if there's some people who are really interested in in discussing some of this more in in some of the overtime but then uh, other people of course will, will be free to leave and uh, uh, just um, Fran Franz, let me do something me... unusual and ask the first question <laughs> Yeah, uh, because no, I wanted totally. I wanted to interrupt you basically, but um, then I, I just waited. So um, I agree with all these challenges. These are also things that concern us quite a bit. Um, I have some always some problems to understand the clear kind of black and white division between model based and model free reinforcement learning. Because um, what I always think, and we perhaps we can discuss this more tomorrow, that it could be very helpful to have even like an MDP like but partial model of, of a system. So we're not saying we have the full representation, but we could use this for some partial planning. And this is, of course, something that could also address the um, same complexity of reinforcement learning by using, and this also, I think, goes 
right into your influence project in some sense. So would you agree that this is a kind of a bit of a blurry expression between these two paradigms? Absolutely. Um, uh, so indeed in this influence project, for instance, um, we assumed uh, mostly that you know we would have a big simulator available or a big model available that we could sample from and, and and do everything with but it's really too complex to use all the time and so we were you know concerned with learning these kind of now local models which are now approximations so we, we were throwing away our, our, our model that we're you know is, is perfect to some extent it's just not fast enough and replacing it with now imperfect but faster model Right, so 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 yeah, that that's that doesn't fit directly, obviously, in 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 a very crisp uh, 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 dichotomy uh, here, I suppose. Um, yeah, and I I think there's a, there's a lot to explore. I also think that indeed uh, where well, most reinforcement learning is currently being applied really to to simulation based planning, right? Settings where simulators are available. Uh, the extent to which people really exploit the fact that it is a simulator that is available uh, uh, varies a lot, right? There's there's certainly some papers that 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 try to you know use the resettable property of a simulator. Uh, if you have a simulator that you can reset to a particular state, you can do different things. Uh, but the focus on those types of, of, of uh, extra features that are offered, right? If you have a simulator, uh, yeah, that's that's not the, the mainstream part of reinforcement learning currently. Um, so yeah, I I, I I I agree. There's there's many kind of like special interest in, interesting special cases to to probably look at. Very nice. Yes. And there's a question in the chat by Pierre Del Desson. Um, what about semi-Markov decision processes? Has reinforcement learning been applied to that framework as well? Uh, yes, uh, semi-Markov decision processes. Um, so usually these pop up in the, um, in the setting of options. And um, so, so just, let, let, let me explain how, how I interpret semi-MDP, because I think there can also be some confusion about what people really mean there. But uh, I think of a semi-MDP as uh, uh, essentially a state is a Markov, but uh, the amount of time that an action can take can be varying. So you get now a transition uh, model uh, that specifies for each state, what is uh, the distribution over next state and delta t essentially, and that shows up a lot in uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning, where people consider uh, so-called options. Options are essentially just you know like uh, sub plans, little policies that you can apply uh, in different bits of your your state space. Right, and this now gives a, a hierarchical uh, approach because you're now choosing these these policies rather than choosing uh, domain level actions. Uh, but of course, if you choose a policy, uh, you're gonna follow this for some amount of time. And that then of course leads to, you know, uh, typically this, 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 this sub policy might be something like uh, your robot needs to get to the door. And then from that door, uh, uh, it needs to open the door and then uh, it needs to go to some other door. Uh, so somehow these, these, these kind of different behaviors uh, uh, that these options correspond to. And so they have then these termination criteria, uh, reaching the door, the door is now open, et cetera. And the amount of time that they can take, of course, may vary. And whether that those sub goals are reached at all, actually. Uh, there's also uh, perhaps a possibility of failure, et cetera. Uh, but in that context, uh, semi-MDPs have been considered uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, I think also in the context of uh, some of the multi-agent decision-making people have been looking at them uh, because you get also these kind of aspects where um, whether uh, if there's another decision maker uh, uh, following some kind of plan, uh, how long its actions or also sub plans take to complete will also vary. You also get these kind of uh, aspects uh, going on. 
yeah, I, that, that those are the two things that pop uh, to my mind directly, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm certain it's incomplete. But uh... any other questions? So I was wondering, Franz, um, I, I could ask an hour of questions, I think, but that's not for this um, um, setting. You, you basically said that, I mean, I guess you have more details on the slide, that partial observability is a challenge for reinforcement learning. Um, I've said this too at some point, but it was several years ago because I, before I knew more. And um, there were robotics people basically said, that's not true, it just works. And um, the, the reasoning was that uh, the challenge is, uh, is not with finite horizons, but with indefinite or uh, infinite horizons. So would you agree with this? Um, so uh, well, I, I would need to understand better how the, 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 the finite versus indefinite horizon uh, factors in here. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, like, like, like just in general, as soon as you have partial observability, um, actually this, this does give me the, the uh, opportunity to quickly flash forward here, right? So, so the problem here now is that we no longer observe the state here, but only this observation, right? And so that means that if we repeat our exercise of before, of, okay, what is RL now? It looks like this, right? So there's there's some actions that you're uh, gonna uh, be doing, but you know you don't really see anything. Uh, we don't see anything yet, and we just get some kind of observation of one. And now, okay, we know this is somehow caused by some state, but we don't know what state it is. So how do we even estimate these effects efficiently, right? It's, it becomes really, really difficult. Okay, we take a a one now. Oh, we get minus one. It's super uninterpretable for, for humans, right? And it's, it's really, really complex uh, setting. And, and so what you need to do, you know, you, you can go on here. Uh, so, so this is a very fun exercise. I'll, I'll, I'll leave this slide uh, uh, here for, for the people who want to break the, the code. Uh, in the meantime, while I'm talking, but uh, you really need to consider these this, this histories of, of actions and observations in order to determine their next effect. And of course, a sequence processing has evolved tremendously. Uh, certainly, you know, look at uh, what ChatGPT, et cetera, can do now. Um, but to do that, you need tons and tons and tons of data. And if you have a reinforcement learning problem, it's not so clear that you would have this. So yeah, if people in robotics say, well, partially observable uh, observability is not so much a problem. Um, in many robotics domains, you know, just good old control engineering uh, may allow us to, you know, come up with state estimators uh, that work quite well. And in those kind of settings, yeah, perhaps uh, you know things will work. I mean, uh, the cruise control on your on your car actually works. Right, that's no no real issue. Uh, but if we are indeed considering, you know, this 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 learning in a very let let, let me call it a very partially observable environment where uh, we just observe clicks or something, and we're trying to infer some of what's going on in the head of our user on the other side. Yeah, I, I do think that there are still quite quite some challenges uh, involved there still. So here, I don't know if anybody has been eyeballing this slide, but uh, or if they could break the, the pattern. But uh, so 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 this is a very 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 simple uh, from the P example where action three is open right and O one means here left, and uh, A one is listen, uh, and uh, action two uh, observation two is here right. So so you can already get now some kind of idea where this is going. And then if I show you this last image, now suddenly perhaps some of these numbers start making sense, right? But so, yeah, so, so, so I think it's, it's very clear that somehow the intuition 
uh, and prior knowledge that we bear on, on, on problem settings. Uh, so here, yeah, you, you need to open the door to the, the treasure. And if you hear the tiger behind the right door, you better open the left door, et cetera, right? But somehow, can we somehow use some of this prior knowledge uh, in a more, uh, in a better way, in a, a repeatable way, right? But people are talking about indeed uh, continual learning or lifelong learning or these kind of things. Like, I think learning in partially observable environments more or less almost automatically requires to do transfer of, of, of previous things that we've we've learned. Uh, is is my subjective belief. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, are there any further questions? Aren't hard ones. Yep, thanks for the uh, nice introduction. So I was wondering the, the way you presented the, the, the standard DQ learning, deep Q learning, and the way I've also seen it most of the time has very regular action space. It's like with a joystick, I think at the Atari games, wherever you are, you can you have these options of going everywhere. So so what happens and do you know what's what's current in, in research and technology therefore if you don't have that? I mean, I see the Go thing already. I don't think I can place uh, pieces on top of other pieces. So I already have a changing space of available actions as the game progresses. And if I think of, I don't know, network protocols, right? I mean, I have completely different things. In one state, I may have choice between sending message A, B, and in another state, a choice between uh, waiting a bit more or canceling a timer or something like this. So yeah. And yeah, I get the impression this doesn't work well together, but I don't know what's up to date there. Okay, if you could comment on that. Yeah, no, I think it's it's a it's a great question. Uh, of course, um, like I said, so 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 the breakthrough in deep reinforcement learning is to somehow rely on neural networks to solve a lot of our problems, right? Solve the scalability, somehow magically do this generalization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, whether you know, that works uh, when indeed actions are completely irregular or perhaps also uh, the input, the observations could also be, you know, like like uh, from one time step to another, this might be very different potentially, right? And and, and then how, how do you encode this still in an effective way? Um, I think it's a relatively open question most of the successes uh, that we've seen uh, also like 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 a lot of the so for instance a uh, uh, deep mind has been pushing their their uh, agents in this 3d excellent environment but also there uh, the, the, the 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 environments are procedurally generated so the environment is is kind of different every time uh, but the agent observe it still via their their uh, vision sensor, so they get the 3D images. Uh, so that is uniform, and their actions is also uh, indeed regular. Huh? So walking around and, and um, doing some some pushing, or so that they can pick up some things uh, or drag some things as well, I believe. But it's it's not like completely different at every time step, and and indeed, yeah, the the way that. You know, a neural network would be able to somehow deal with, you know, very, yeah, very different uh, uh, inputs and outputs in a sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certain huh, that with a lot of engineering and effort, people can uh, mm -hmm. can come up with something that 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 has been the experience in the last ten years. Uh, but yeah, it may not be easy, and I, I don't think it will work out of the box. Okay, thanks. I think, uh, Matthias. Uh... Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the for the great introduction um, to, to, to reinforcement learning. And um, I have a question regarding um, um, for, for, for reinforcement learning, it's usually the case that you have um, rewards uh, also at, at intermediate states. Um, what happens if you only have uh, can have a reward very much to the end? For example, in predictive maintenance, where um, you if you if you do some maintenance in between, um, then it will incur some cost. But the reward that the system will not fail, you get you only get at the at the very end, let's say. 
So are there approaches or te techniques for, for, let's say, a long time horizon? Yeah, no, excellent question. Uh, uh, and uh, I can actually use this to uh, uh, try and segue in, you know, one of the, 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 the uh, examples that I uh, still had here as well. Um, it, it falls in uh, uh, directly with the example that I often uh, li li like to make, you know, of uh, robot soccer, right? Like if we uh, want to somehow train uh, a robot soccer team with reinforcement learning, uh, what 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 kind of, of of goal do we give them, right? Uh, we can just say, well, win the uh, win the game, and then you get plus one, um, and that's that's really all because that's our real our real goal. And then of course uh, this is not going to work, right? Uh, so what people do in practice is uh, you know perhaps give some rewards for uh, taking the ball and dribbling and you know a reward for passing and etc uh, etc et so you're then you know in introducing reward shaping or introducing auxiliary reward functions to still somehow get these agents to do something uh, but at the same time you may be changing your problem and it's indeed quite dangerous and may lead to completely uh, uh, unintended side effects, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the robot uh, uh, soccer players are now only dribbling or only passing back and forth and back and forth, right? Because, well, that's the way how they get now the reward. And, uh, you know, even, even uh, uh, if we don't uh, do that, uh, things may, uh, may somehow fail here. Let me, I almost said it. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, nice uh, examples. Let me try and see if the, the link still works. Yeah, here. Do you guys see uh, my browser here as well? Yeah. Let me now try and find the video. Oh yeah, here. All right, I can go full screen. So they were training this, uh, this boat uh, uh, to you know, do the boat race. And uh, in order to do this, they gave uh, uh, the boat just points, uh, the points that you accrue in the game, right? So there's this score thing. I think they directly use this. Um, and this now is what, uh, what, what the boat learned. So it's, it's hoovering, making the circle around here. And every time these turbo thingies pop up again, and it's collecting the point for these turbo things. Right, so, so even here, in the case where you think that you have a relatively objective uh, uh, reward function, uh, just based on the scores that you're getting in this game, yeah, the, the, the outcome of, of what's learned here is not what was intended, right? So, so yeah, uh, the, the question of, yeah, how, how, how can you optimize long-term rewards or how can you even specify the right uh, uh, rewards is, is, yeah, it's, quite non-trivial. Um, people like Stuart Russell uh, have been uh, also, you know, uh, making uh, uh, an important case for this for a number of years already, uh, uh, as well, uh, what that may also mean uh, uh, in terms of uh, the safety of AI, right? Uh, essentially trying to prevent this Terminator scenario, right? Um, so yeah, I think these these are quite important questions. I am a very optimistic person myself, by the way. I, I don't think that that AI will uh, terminate us uh, uh, tomorrow or the day after. Um, but yeah, starting to think about yeah, how do you specify rewards? Uh, uh, you know, when they're long term rewards, or whether when 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 you want to be certain that things are going to be safe, etc. Yeah, they are still quite open, open questions, I think. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, one more question that, that at least I need to leave. Marius and Witzel. Hi, thank you uh, for the presentation. I couldn't help but wonder that there was a slide about efficient zero, which I think is uh, an extension of Alpha Zero, which tries to simultaneously learn a model and then also use this for planning. Yeah. I was wondering what your vision was uh, on this because it might help 
uh, even in the case of sparse rewards to have this model that you're learning along the way to increase maybe the search depth that you have. Um, and also you might use this model to give some more insights onto what you're actually learning. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on this algorithm, so to say. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, in, in general, I'm uh, very, uh, 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 here, let me try. This is, oh, oh that didn't work as intended. Uh, and let me turn off all the blabber as well. <laughs> uh, let me quickly, here, what's going on here? here. Boop, 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 boop. I think indeed, uh, yeah, here we go, learning models. So in, in general, uh, I'm very fond of trying to learn models, right? Because uh, if you have a model, it can support much more than just only your current task. It actually means that somehow you're, you're trying to understand the world that you're in, right? And I think that is a, uh, from a sort of general artificial intelligence perspective, uh, yeah, very compelling and, and almost a no-brainer, I would say. Uh, so in general, I, I, I like these uh, uh, things a lot. Then, of course, the question is, how do you do this? And uh, yeah, so I had this paper with uh, uh, Elise van der Poel, uh, who will be defending her thesis in a month from now or so, less than a month from now, uh, I believe. And we worked a little bit on this on this topic, and then uh, yeah, somehow a really important thing is to, or at least well in our experience, was to put the appropriate constraints on essentially the latent spaces that you're trying to learn uh, your model in. And so this was a very simple example of a person needing to collect the key and then go into a goal or something in you know this image, uh, but. You know, so so that's a very clear structure, and and somehow that was a structure that we were able to recover uh, in somehow you know a model learned uh, in a latent space, right? So somehow there's a, a, a grid where you don't have the key yet, and then you go to the key position, you pick it up, you come to the other grid, and then you navigate to the goal, right? Essentially, uh, this is what you're seeing here, uh, and a lot of the other. Uh, uh, model-based methods that we tried yet yeah, didn't give that kind of like structured, nice, interpretable space. Um, so I think uh, Efficient Zero, who applied very similar types of uh, uh, auxiliary rewards as a form of contrasting, tr contrastive training, yada, yada, yada. Um, and yeah, so, so, so I think it's a further indication that that need really, really can help. Uh, how good those models still really are. Um, I, I do think, you know, that's not completely clear yet. I'm actually doing some work on that uh, uh, with a student, Jinke, uh, at the moment. Uh, so if you're interested in these kind of topics, feel free to reach out. I can talk if we can already share a, a draft or not. But uh, yeah, those, those are very interesting questions, I think. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for asking. Okay, great. So Marius is coming tomorrow. He can also reach out then. This, is, uh, this makes it easy. Oh, perfect. Um, perfect. Um, yeah, so, there... yeah, it's, it's, it's been no, extremely no condensed. I, I saw some people were coming, but I apologize. Yeah. I didn't register. Uh, <laughs> oh, and then, that was like, not expected. Oh, I just want, want to mention. Um, is there any other quick question? Okay, then. Then let us thank Franz for this very nice talk. I, I will do clap, clap for real, so you can all decide what you want to <laughs> well, It was my pleasure. Uh, thank you for, uh, for listening and uh, asking uh, uh, a very good, interesting questions. I really enjoyed this. It was very nice. Franz, thanks a lot. And see you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.